Maestro 1 opens up with something of a surreal setting, with Professor Hulk completely destroying a sentinel, while reminiscing about how good life currently is for him and how happy he, Betty, and their sons are together. Which is interesting right out the gate because he and Betty never had kids. We then see Cap, Thor, and Wolverine show up just to praise the Hulk for taking down the Sentinel single-handedly, followed by another off moment with Betty showing up to reiterate how perfect everything is. We then jump to the Avengers Mansion, where the Hulk and Betty are now sitting for dinner while their two sons, Thaddeus and Rick, run around playing. The Hulk continues to reflect to himself about how his days of dealing with his identity disorder are long behind him and that he's better. But as he's saying these things to himself, Betty tells their sons to stop playing and eat. But one of the boys responds to her by saying, we don't have to do what you say. And when Betty asks why, he answers, because you're dead. You know the saying, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is? Yeah. That applies here. Anyway, his son's answer obviously gets the Hulk's attention, and he asks Betty, what is he talking about? But she basically ignores him and continues to talk about dinner. While the son starts saying, she's dead, Rick's dead, Thaddeus Ross is dead, 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 dead. This freaks Hulk out even more as he starts demanding answers from Betty, at which point she starts repeating HTTP 404, bad command or file name. Like some kind of glitching computer program, then suddenly vanishes along with everything else, leaving the Hulk standing in darkness. Captain America then shows up out of nowhere and tells him that everything is fine and that Mysterio was toying with his mind, causing him to see and hear things that weren't really happening. But the Hulk senses something is off and says no, none of this makes any sense, and tries to leave the house, but when he walks through a door he finds himself in a room that looks like the inside of a computer and says, if this is Mysterio, he's managed to raise himself up to Doctor Strange levels of illusion. Then just as suddenly, the inside of the house reappeared around him and he found himself face to face with several members of the Avengers, including Black Widow, who starts to say the Hulk lullaby from the MCU to calm him down, saying, the sun's getting real low. But the Hulk just responds abruptly saying, what are you talking about, Widow? Overall, that's a pretty funny crossover reference for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And notice that Black Widow, who appears here, even resembles Scarlett Johansson Black Widow. So that's pretty interesting as well. Multiverse? Anyway, the Hulk isn't interested in whatever game was being played here and once again tries to leave, only to have Thor try to stop him by grabbing his arm. But the frustrated and increasingly impatient Hulk backhands Thor across the room, while simultaneously thinking to himself, this feels like a dream. All of the Avengers then try to charge him at once, but he just hits them with a thunderclap, which sends them all flying, all but the Vision that is, who was unaffected by the vibrations due to his phasing abilities. We then see Vision approach the Hulk and say, I apologize for this Dr. Banner, it's the only way, as he begins to to phase his hand into the Hulk's mind as a last ditch attempt to make him calm down. But the Hulk somehow manages to focus his mind, grabs Vision's arm, and screams, get out of my head. And when he does, we see him break free of the Matrix and wake up in the real world, hooked to all sorts of tubes and sensors that look straight out of the Weapon X program. Now you all know I'm not much of a gamer, but I do love a good immersive mobile game. And I was recently introduced to the Lord of the Rings Heroes of Middle Earth game, and it's freaking awesome. Today's sponsor, the Lord of the Rings Heroes of Middle Earth is a new CRPG that lets you collect your favorite characters, both good and evil, and then explore Middle-earth. I'm talking you could relive your favorite stories along with some new ones rooted in Tolkien's works. For instance, in one of the main new stories, you discover a previously unknown ring of power that you could use to forge a different course for Middle-earth. So it gives you the best of both options. Also, one of our favorite legendary characters, Lord Elrond, is coming soon to Heroes of Middle-earth. And you'll want to jump on and collect five elven characters before his Legendary Adventure event starts on June 26th. Legendary Adventures are limited time events that give players an opportunity to upgrade their characters and unlock powerful legendary characters. Legendary adventures may return in the future, but are only available for a short time, so make sure to be prepared with five elven characters. Even if you miss Elrond's legendary adventure event, there are still a crap ton of exciting Lord of the Rings characters to collect and stories to explore. So if you're a Lord of the Rings fan or you love a great CRPG, just download Lord of the Rings Heroes of Middle-earth for free using the link in the description or by scanning the QR code with your phone. You can thank us later. The now completely this oriented Hulk begins to look around and asks, where am I and how long have I been here? At which point a strange woman and a small boy walk up wearing futuristic protective bodysuits and Hulk confuses the identity of the boy, automatically thinking it's his Matrix son Rick. But after a brief back and forth with the woman and a you're not my daddy moment with the boy, a group of AIM soldiers come flying in wearing what looks like new type of stormtrooper armor and they start yelling for the Hulk to freeze. For those of you who aren't familiar with AIM, it stands for Advanced Idea Mechanics. They were originally created as a scientific research 
arm of Hydra, but later broke off on their own. Their group also made its first MCU appearance in Iron Man 3. But let's get back to the story. The AIM soldiers threaten to use their weapons on the Hulk, which doesn't phase him one bit. He just walks straight up to them and dares them to shoot by saying, come on, let's see what you've got. Don't keep me waiting. It turns out, however, that their weapons are highly advanced and more powerful than he thought. So when the soldiers opened fire, the Hulk got launched into the back wall. But just before he blacked out, he hammer punches his way through the floor and drops to the lower level. He then finds himself in yet another room similar to the one he woke up in, with other tanks with people being kept in suspended animation like he was, including Abomination. But just as he began to analyze the situation, the AIM soldiers cap up to him and come rushing in. Now fed up with all of it, the Hulk attempts to rush them, but runs right into a force field, immediately followed by another single laser blast that launches him backward. The Hulk then hears someone say, that's enough of that, and he looks up to see that the blast came from none other than a much older MODOK. As a side note, I just have to mention that this is a really cool and interesting addition for an underused villain by Peter David. But if you have no idea who MODOK is, it's actually an acronym that stands for Mental Organism Designed Only for Killing. Once just a man and average technician for AIM named George Tarleton, he was selected by Hydra to be mutated and bioengineered into a living computer in order to explore the mysteries and test the capabilities of the cosmic cube. But instead, the cube drove him insane and he became a homicidal maniac machine. Seems legit. With that understood, MODOK says to the Hulk, I assume you remember me, Doctor. And when the Hulk looks up and he sees MODOK, he says to himself, my god, he looks like he's aged 100 years. Although the issue doesn't specifically clarify how much time has passed, or exactly how long Hulk was kept in suspended animation. The Hulk goes on to ask, what's going on? Where's Betty? Where's Rick Jones? To which MODOK answers, they're dead, Doctor. Long dead. This understandably sends the Hulk into a rage, as his immediate assumption is that MODOK is responsible for whatever happened to them and everything that's going on in general. So he attacks attacks MODOK screaming, what did you do? Tackling him to the ground. But when he does, MODOK begins to say, what are you going to do, doctor? Kill me? Go ahead. End my life. If you call this a life, you'd be doing me a favor. Come on. The Hulk then pulls his fist back to smash him, but sees the seriousness in MODOK's face and stops himself. So MODOK uses his doomsday chair to stand himself back up and says, to be honest, I had forgotten you were down here. My circuitry is failing, I fear. Credit it to age. The Hulk then asks, you said they were dead. How did they die? Who was it? The leader? Dr. Doom? You? And MODOK answers, they did. A confused Hulk responds by asking, they who? Hydra? And MODOK angrily responds, no you idiot, the great they. Whenever you complain about the awful things they are doing to the world because of their stupid decisions, your leaders, your governments, the great unwashed they, then anger turns to sadness in his eyes as he says, World War III. MODOK then goes on to explain that many years ago, a terrorist group sets off nuclear weapons in both the United States and Russia and then hack the computer systems of the two countries to make each of them believe that the other was responsible for the attack. This led to a full-blown nuclear war holocaust, which wiped out 60% of humanity. As if that wasn't horrific enough, years later, another psychotic group who called themselves the Black Scythe had decided that humankind's time on Earth was at an end and determined to kill all remaining human beings on the planet. As MODOK goes on to explain, the murderous Black Scythe members unleashed a toxic gas on hundreds of cities throughout the world. And as MODOK puts it, it was most efficient. A now depressed Hulk asks, why don't I remember any of this? And MODOK explains that when the first missiles fell, he and his group of AIM soldiers gathered the Hulk and others seemingly benefited from any kind of radiation, like gamma and cosmic rays, and brought them to their secret underground bunker below the streets of Los Angeles, placing them in a controlled state of suspended animation until things improved. The Hulk growing increasingly jaded and angry with every passing word decides that he needs proof. He needs to see for himself if it's all really gone. And as he smashes his way into the elevator shaft that leads to the surface, he considers whether it could be all a lie. He says to himself, wouldn't the heroes have stopped it somehow? But his hope quickly fades as he says to himself, the fact is you can't save a world that's determined to destroy itself. And that pessimism is immediately validated as he leaps straight through the top of the shaft and breaks through to the surface, where he finds a completely bombed out and destroyed Los Angeles. Staring in disbelief, the Hulk says, my God, he wasn't lying. They really did it. They blew themselves to hell. All the adventures we heroes had, everything we did to protect them from the bad guys, but we couldn't protect them from themselves. Hulk then wanders up to the Hollywood sign, which oddly survived when MODOK catches up to him. MODOK basically asks him to come back with him and be part of rebuilding humanity. But the Hulk responds by saying, why? So that humanity can re regenerate, thrive, and blow itself up again? And as MODOK attempts to answer by saying, one would hope the same end wouldn't result. The Hulk then just begins to walk away saying, no thanks. MODOK tries to plead with him saying, come with me, Dr. Banner, you could have friends. But the Hulk cuts him off again by responding, I don't need them. Friends die and stop calling me Dr. Banner. That's not me anymore. MODOK then asks, so you're the Hulk full time now, are you? And the Hulk responds, for now, we'll see what the future brings. And as the issue ends, he leaps away and we see that he's changed what's left of the Hollywood sign to say, 
Hulk. Getting right into it, issue two picks up exactly where issue one of Maestro left off, with the Hulk looking at a very dystopian Earth, thinking of how the humans did this, destroying each other in World War III. We even see the Hulk saying to himself, I prayed he was exaggerating. I mean, MODOK is a bad guy. Bad guys lie. Kind of what they do. I've known so many bad guys and so many good guys, and they all knew me. Or at least they thought they did. Hell, we all think we know each other. We even think we know ourselves. But the truth is, we know nothing. Knew nothing. I should really start getting used to referring to humanity in past tense. Because I have to say, when it came to the subject of obliterating itself, humanity was remarkably thorough, as the Hulk stands up and the next page gives us a wide shot of the Hulk standing on top of Mount Rushmore, which has been destroyed. The Hulk then continues making his way around the country by jumping, and we see that the Hoover Dam got annihilated, which led to several towns miles away being flooded. We also see most of Las Vegas laid to waste. Even the national parks are inhabitable, as everything in this world became toxic with radiation, so anything the animals ate was poison, which killed them. The comic then shows us Hulk's soft side as tears roll down his face, holding a dead animal, saying, they didn't even understand why the things they were eating were poison. Hulk then says, I'm reminded of all the humans who believed in God, who thought they were going to walk in the kingdom of heaven if they just obeyed his word. People who believed that God had a plan. As he looks up to the sky with a pissed off face saying, screw you God, you and your plan. Don't like my attitude? Come and get me, as he leaps into the sky. The Hulk continues making his journey across the country saying, no matter where I go from coast to coast, all I see is evidence of human stupidity. And there was no greater source of that stupidity than here in the nation's capital. As we see the Washington Monument completely destroyed, along with the Lincoln Memorial. But as the Hulk is looking at what's left of the Lincoln Memorial, he sees a kid with some kind of breathing device running away to which he says, the hell? My God, who the hell is that? He seems okay, certainly isn't dying, so that's a plus. I'm not sure if he's running away from me or towards something else, or maybe both. The Hulk then follows him and sees the kid go underground through a secret door, at which point, of course, the Hulk follows him. The trap door then leads the Hulk underground to what looks like a sewer system straight out of the Ninja Turtles. And as he starts following the boy, a bunch of guns and lights start pointing at him with someone yelling, halt, to which the Hulk Hulk says, oh perfect, okay wait, hold on, I have an itch right there, it's driving me nuts. Focus your fire there. That'd be great, thanks, as he turns around showing them his back. Essentially he was low key being like, hey guys, do you really think gunfire is gonna hurt me? As he makes this joke, a voice says, very amusing Dr. Banner, we fought many years ago, but I looked quite different then. Machine man, but you can call me Aaron. Welcome to the bunker, I would invite you to stay, but our resources are limited and would preclude your needs. Hulk then replies, looking good, and machine man says, yes, well, being immortal will do that to you. And Hulk says, oh, I don't know, I'm immortal and I look like crap. In any case, Machine Man then starts showing the Hulk around, eventually showing him the White House, telling him that the president and vice president are dead along with the cabinet congress. Essentially, the entire concept of government is deceased. Now there's just survivors. Machine Man then takes the Hulk to their security room where they have tons of monitors and computers connected to cameras watching all over the country. Machine Man then starts telling the Hulk basically these quarters are populated by the descendants of White House employees who escaped down here while the bombs started flying. We have enough supplies to last another 17 years, although I calculated that your life likely calorie intake would drop it to 3.9. Basically, we learned that this wasn't a sewer system at all that the Hulk followed the boy into, but the secret underground tunnels built under the White House for the president. In any case, Machine Man and his people then bring up Dystopia, formerly known as New York City. He tells the Hulk it was constructed by its overseer. He goes by the name Maestro. It's Italian for master. So for anyone wondering what Maestro meant, thank you, Machine Man. Hulk then replies, I know what it means. You don't have to worry about me eating your rations. I gotta meet this guy. Hulk then leaves, leaping his way across the country to find this Maestro, saying to himself, Maestro is the nickname I picked up in college because I was so far ahead of everybody. But midair, the Hulk starts feeling dizzy saying, what's wrong with me? Having trouble focusing as he crashes into the ground. He then starts sitting up saying, so it seems I may have my limits. I thought I could just absorb the ambient radiation, but even my body needs time to heal, I guess. Maybe I just need to rest for a little bit. But as he says this, he looks up to the sky saying, oh my God. He continues to say, as he looks at a swarm of bugs, it was always predicted that once humanity went extinct, only cockroaches would survive. It seems the radiation only spread that along as these cockroaches or bugs start attacking him, tearing into his flesh. But luckily for the Hulk, someone with some sort of sonic wave gun is able to fend off the bugs, saving the Hulk. But before he could say thank you, he collapses to the ground. They then pick up the Hulk's body, put it in their truck, and take him to the camp. When he wakes up and heals from his wounds, he's greeted by Boz. He then shows the Hulk around, saying, we call ourselves the Wasteland Survivalists. We are endeavoring to restore nutrients to the ground in order to grow crops. We have had sufficient success so far, but we dream of greater. And as they get to the high point of their camp, Hulk sees dystopia. While looking at it in the distance, Hulk asks Boz, tell me about the maestro. He replies, they say he's a god. Hulk then says, now I really gotta meet him. The comic then takes us to some facility where an old man only referred to as Gramps at this point in time is sitting in Professor X's hover chair, playing the harmonica. But not only that, the room he's in is full of memorabilia and or trophies from heroes who have died, like Spider-Man's mask and web shooter, Thor's hammer, Magneto's helmet, Wolverine's entire skeleton, Vision and Warlock's head, and freaking Beast's fur hung up on the wall like bearskin, even Winter Soldier's metal arm and Silver Surfer's board. There's a crap ton of Easter eggs in this panel. You guys should definitely stare at it and play 
it, where's Waldo picking out all the Easter eggs? Because let me just tell you, I didn't name everything that's in this panel. In any case, a young girl then starts saying, Gramps, Gramps. He then says, damn it, Janice, I almost had it. Meaning this is probably Janice Jones, which also means this could be Rick Jones, AKA Hulk's best friend. She then tells him, you need to know this. He's back, that green guy you used to love. He replies, Oscar the Grouch? She's like, no, the big hulking guy. And he says, the Hulk? She's like, yeah, that's it. The cord said he walked right into town square, big as life. The comic then shows us the Hulk has made his way to dystopia, formerly known as New York City. While making his way through the city, people keep stopping him saying, what are you? But ultimately someone asks, are you the Hulk? And he says, who wants to know? The man replies, I am the minister. The maestro dispatched me to bring you to him. On the way there, Hulk says, who is this maestro? The minister replies, he is our God. Hulk says, yes, I've heard that. Where did he come from? The minister replies, wherever gods come from. The Hulk finally says, you're being less than helpful. Once inside, the minister says, maestro, your visitor's here. And from behind a giant red curtain, he says, is it him? He says, I believe it is. Maestro then comes out from behind the curtain saying, Banner, it's been ages. Revealing the Maestro is Marvel's Hercules as the issue ends. But there's a three page backup story that's part one of three titled Relics. In said story, we see Janice Jones, Rick Jones' granddaughter, which confirms that the Janice from earlier is Janice Jones, meaning that that Gramps guy is in fact Rick Jones. But anyway, Janice is with a character named Decord looking for weapons of fallen heroes. Decord literally has Captain America's shield on her back and they find Thor's hammer. Decord isn't able to lift it, so Janice gives it a shot and it turns out she's worthy, which I don't know how I feel about all these characters being worthy lately, but I guess it is what it is. They had to figure some way for it to be picked up and brought back to Rick Jones to be kept in his trophy room, but this brings us to issue three. The issue starts off with Hercules welcoming the Hulk, with the Hulk saying, Hercules, you're the maestro? He replies, I am indeed, Banner. By Zeus, it is good to see you. He then runs over to the Hulk and picks him up, hugging the Hulk. Hercules says, I thought you were dead. Where have you been? He replies, Modok had me on ice. He then punches the Hulk so hard, he flies out of the castle. Hercules is all like, you've gotten rusty, Banner. I thought you could take a punch. Hulk, while laying on the ground, then says, bloody hell, and pops his jaw back into place. Hercules then charges him again, but the Hulk blocks this time, saying, that hurt you, Olympian oaf and this time punches Hercules back, sending him flying. Essentially, they start having a sparring match as Hercules is happy to fight someone who's giving him a challenge. He even says, with no one to oppose me, I feared I lost my edge. My deepest thanks for helping me shed those concerns, as he breaks the ground beneath Hulk, causing him to fall underground. Now underground, the Hulk says, I'm gonna kill him, he's going down. But before he can finish his sentence, the Cord and his fizz come out introducing themselves to the Hulk saying, Rick Jones wants to see you. He then turns around and says, what did you just say? Meanwhile, on the surface, Hercules is thanking the Hulk for the sparring session saying, by God, that was glorious. I hope you did not misunderstand, Banner. That was simply my way of doing you honor. Come now. I have a number of robust women who would like to make your acquaintance and the best food in the region. But once Hercules looks down to where the Hulk fell, he sees that he's gone saying, well, this is most irritating. Meanwhile, Hulk makes his way back to Rick Jones who is still in that Jim Lee style Professor X hover chair. Rick says, this is Janice, my granddaughter. She then checks the Hulk to see if he's clean, which he is, and he says, thanks. After the Hulk and Rick Jones briefly catch up as old friends do, Rick says, I hear you ran into Hercules or the maestro as he's called now. Hulk says, are we sure it's really him and not a scroll imposter or something like that? He replies, oh yeah, it's him, but he's changed. He only cares about sex, partying, and living like there's no tomorrow. But the city's full with ordinary people just trying to survive, and he doesn't give a crap about them at all. Hulk says, ordinary people? He doesn't care about them? Rick says, that's right. And Hulk replies, why should he? Rick's like, what? The Hulk continues to say, this room is full of trophies you've been maintaining. All these heroes fought on behalf of ordinary people. Fought against the schemes of villains to rule them. Ordinary people destroyed the world, Rick. Not the leader, not the Red Skull. None of the villains we fought and died against. Ordinary damn people brought it down around their bloody ears as he starts throwing things around the trophy room. Also, I need to pause and point out that they're using Silver Surfer's broken board as a coffee table. I just, I just, I just need to throw that out there. And again, keep looking around this trophy room or whatever you want to call it as there's tons of Easter eggs like the Destroyer helmet and others. Hulk then gets in Rick's face saying if Hercules had any brains, he would lay waste to all the ordinary people. Just mow them down. Give me one good reason why anyone should care about ordinary people. Rick then says, because Betty was one, so was Marlo and me. And once upon a time, so are you. Hulk's essentially like, whatever. And while walking out, he says, they're sheep, Rick. That's all they are. That's all they're good for. They should be ruled with an iron hand, used to form an army that could bring unity to the world. Rick then says, under whose rule? Yours? Hulk replies, we could do worse. And before Hulk leaves the room, Rick tells him, you sound like Dr. Doom. Hulk finally says, maybe Doom was onto something. I need a lab. Rick then says, you can use what's left of Alchemax, which was a scientific center before science stopped mattering.
firing. Once there, Hulk leaps inside, taking a look around to see what he could use. Eventually, he sees a sign that says Lab Rats. He then says, that sounds promising. I mean, even if it's literal, that could be promising. Cyber Rats, those would be useful weapons. And when he makes his way inside, he says, holy cow, I just struck the mother load. As he sees a bunch of bodies kept in some sort of cryostasis chambers, he then cracks his finger saying, well, I know what I'm gonna be doing for the next few months. We are then taken back to Maestro's kingdom where he's about to get it on with one of his ladies before the minister informs him that he found the Hulk. So of course he drops the girl and gets on his futuristic scooter thing, making his way towards the Hulk. Meanwhile, the Hulk is on top of a building talking to all the people of dystopia, saying, I am told you were ordinary people. Well, I don't believe that. Ordinary is a term assigned to you by those who believe they are your betters. But I have seen what ordinary people can do. Ordinary people created vaccines that saved the lives of millions. Ordinary people took us to the moon. Ordinary people saw not what was, but what could be. Ordinary people made themselves extraordinary because the leaders told them where to go and what to do. And I am prepared to do that. There's a world beyond dystopia. I have seen it and rode across it, and I'm ready to rule it. With your help, we could build this country up and make it greater than it ever was. Let me give you a glimpse of what I can provide. He then proceeds to show them a bunch of dogs of war, as he calls them, that look like Ravage from Michael Bay's Transformer films. He's all like, these dogs of war will do the fighting, they will be our army, and all you have to do is clean up behind them. Who will join me? Who will leave this city behind and dream of taking the entirety of the country, of making it greater than ever dreamed? Who's with me? And the people are like, no way, big green guy is nuts, the hell with that. The Hulk then looks down at them saying, fine, have it your way, sick him, as he sicks his war dogs on the people, with the final page of the comic showing us Hercules arriving saying, now we have a ball game. Issue four picks up right where issue three of Maestro left off, with the Hulk trying to convince Dystopia to follow him by threatening them with his war dogs, which are giant robotic dogs that he built, which look like something out of a Michael Bay Transformers movie. In any case, the Hulk even tells the people, I warned you, I gave you all a chance, but you decided to ignore me snub me, walk away from me, fine, now you get to run, as the dogs of war start attacking the people of dystopia. And just as the Hulk sicks one of his war dogs on them, the maestro or Hercules shows up saying no, while saving one of his people from the jaws of a war dog. Hercules then proceeds to rip off one of the war dog's heads while looking up at the Hulk saying, tell me Banner, is this truly the best you can do? I have thought better of you. It is tragic to discover that I overestimated you. Come Banner, impress me, give me your best shot, all while Hercules continues to destroy Hulk's war dogs. Hulk now more infuriated than ever leaps towards Hercules saying, you want it, you got it, trying to land a Superman punch. But on the next page, we see the Hulk is in shock saying, huh? We learn that's because Hercules just caught the punch with his bare hand saying, was that supposed to impress me? He then throws the Hulk in the air saying, this is a disappointment. But it appears I must express it in a more demonstrative manner, as he grabs the Hulk by his big toe and then proceeds to slam him back and forth before throwing him to the side saying, puny banner. Now we have to pause right here because this is 100% an homage to what the Hulk did to Loki at the end of the first Avengers movie, where he grabbed him by the leg and then slammed him back and forth before ultimately saying, puny god. They even went so far to insert a panel where Hercules pauses for a second while holding the Hulk by the foot, just like the Hulk did to Loki in the Avengers movie. Then of course, instead of Hercules saying puny god, he said puny banner. This is a very pleasant surprise, I must say. Great homage. Anyway, a few seconds later, Hulk gets back up and tackles Hercules, getting on top of him saying, I'll kill you. I'll freaking kill you. Hercules then tells the Hulk, do you know how many people have made that threat? How many titans, monsters, demons over thousands of years? But guess what, Banner? I'm still here. As he blocks and grabs Hulk's fists, continuing to say, they're threats. Nothing but barely remembered echoes in my ears and I'm still here. Hercules then rises to his feet while crushing Hulk's hands, bringing him to his knees saying, their bodies long ago reduced to forgotten dust, and I'm still here. And in 500 years, when your body is departed and your memory forgotten, I will still be here. As he lifts the Hulk off the ground and then slams him on the concrete. He then kicks the Hulk saying, when you were mindless, this would have not stopped you. It would have simply enraged you, made you stronger. Because the matter you got, the more powerful you became. But that isn't you anymore, is it? Banner's brain is in control. Banner understands how overpowered he is. Banner knows when he's outmatched. Banner knows he cannot fight, not against the might of the maestro, as he continues to lay blows into Hulk. Hercules then tells the Hulk, I'm not enjoying this, Banner. It ceased to be fun for me. Surrender, surrender before I kill you, as he continues to lay blows into the Hulk, punching him deeper into the concrete, at which point the Hulk finally says, I give up. Happy? Hercules then stops and offers the Hulk a hand up, saying, more relieved actually, I truly did not wish to kill you. Stand, Banner, stand and embrace me. Hercules then picks him up and hugs Hulk while the Hulk says, yeah, okay, this is getting weird now. Hercules then says, come with me to my palace and drown yourself in good food and female companionship. But the Hulk declines saying, I insulted and attacked your subjects. I must make amends. I'll return at some point in the future when I can sufficiently do so. Elsewhere, Rick Jones tells the court, it's not gonna end well. Did I ever tell you about Bruce's past? He was abused as a kid by his father. Bruce 
Banner, the guy I met, the one who saved my life, he was just one splintered personality. The guy who was here earlier, that's the real Bruce. He basically makes the point that this selfless guy who nearly killed himself to rescue him all those years ago was not the man who was here earlier. But the Bruce that was there wouldn't give up. He would scheme and eventually think of a plot, and he would win. It might take some time, but sooner or later, he'll come back. And trust me, Hercules is gonna die. Telling them this, and us the reader, that the Hulk only surrendered so he could figure out a plan on how to beat Hercules. And Rick is saying all this while wearing Scarlet Spider's hoodie. Yeah, don't think I didn't catch that. The Scarlet Spider is one of my favorite Spider-Men, so it's awesome that Rick is wearing his blue hoodie. The comic then jumps to an unknown amount of time, but at least several months into the future. And we see that the Hulk has returned to Hercules' palace, accompanied by a woman wearing a cloak. The Hulk then asks if the maestro was available and that he brought some company. They tell him indeed, and when Hercules arrives, he says, Banner, it's been quite some time. Hulk then says, yes, I had some adventures, got my neck broken at some point, so that put me out for a while. But Hercules then responds, yes, I'm sure. And who is your associate? He says, this is Anne Darnell. And then says, Bruce has told me so much about you as she takes off her cloak, standing there in nothing but her underwear, while saying, I'm very anxious to make your acquaintance, maestro. Meaning she's there to do the no pants dance with the maestro. Hercules then looks at her saying, well, unarmed I see, good choice of wardrobe. Hercules then escorts Anne to his chambers and tells the Hulk, feel free to entertain yourself around the palace. Hulk then asks the minister if he could see the maestro's throne room, but says, before we go, I have to get something I left outside. Back in Hercules' bedroom, Hercules tells Anne, let us get better acquainted. And she responds saying, I was thinking exactly the same thing while taking off her bra. And right as the two of them are gonna get it on, Anne turns into gas, revealing herself to be vapor. She then tells Hercules, don't you remember the UFOs? It kept me out of the game for a while, but now I'm back. And this gas, it's arson, main ingredient of arsenic as she makes her way through his nostrils and mouth. At which point Hercules falls to his knees as his eyes start to bleed and he dies by his bed. Vapor then says, perfect, that was easier than I could have. But before she can finish her sentence, the Hulk kicks the doors down and freezes her with a gun he found laying around at Alchemax. Hulk then says, there we go, that's better. A vast improvement but it still needs something, as he punches her, shattering her into a thousand pieces. He then tells the maestro's guards to take all these pieces and bury them individually all over the kingdom, out in the plains, make sure they can never reintegrate. He then walks over to Hercules saying, sorry, didn't really have a choice. Nobody beats the Hulk, nobody. He then walks out while saying, get him out of here. And this, my friends, brings us to the fifth and final issue of the miniseries. Issue five opens up with the Hulk bringing Hercules' body out to his funeral, with him saying to himself, well, that was easy. Vapor was never one for murder, but fortunately I was able to appeal to her lesser nature. Now she's in shattered pieces throughout dystopia. Hercules is dead, people are in mourning, and all I have to do is kick back and let matters take their logical course. While Hercules' body is being cremated in the center of dystopia, which looks more like him being burnt to the stake, but whatever, Hulk shouts to the people of dystopia, the maestro will live on in all of our memories. That much is certain. He developed dystopia, gave you all somewhere to live, and a way in which to survive. In this day and age, that contribution cannot be underestimated. But now, it's time to move on. And I shall lead you on that path. And I shall help you march forward. And one of the people say, why you? Who put you in charge? Why would the maestro want you to run things? Maybe we should have, I don't know, an election or something. Elsewhere, Rick Jones is watching via a drone. And once the guy says we should have an election or something, Jones says sarcastically, yeah. That's gonna end well. Back in dystopia, Hulk responds to the man saying, an election, like the maestro was elected? Then someone in the crowd says, it was a different time. Then Hulk responds, so is this. But if you don't believe me, perhaps you'd like to take it up with my dogs of war. Here's some now. I'm sure they'll be happy to discuss it. Gentlemen, attack, as he sicks them on the people of dystopia. But moments after he sicks the dogs of war on the people, Decord shows up blasting one of them with a gun Forge built and she stole from Rick Jones' trophy room. But not only that, we later find out this gun was built by Forge to specifically kill the Hulk. The cord then fires at the Hulk but misses, at which point he punches the ground so hard it breaks the ground beneath her. The Hulk then walks towards her, ready to kill her, as we hear someone yell the name Banner. And on the next page, we see Hercules is alive and on fire saying, you did this to me. Hulk then looks at him in disbelief saying, that's impossible, you can't be alive. But as Hercules walks towards him, he says, because that woman you brought to murder me, she did. But Hades is doing me a favor, allowing me to wreak vengeance on you, as he uppercuts the Hulk. Hercules then starts beating the crap out of the Hulk like he did last issue, and would have even killed the Hulk, even saying, now die before the Prince of Power. But as he's about to deliver a death blow to the Hulk, we see Hercules get blasted with Forge's gun, killing him again. Then on the next page, the Hulk says, huh, as Hercules' body disintegrates. We then see that it was the minister who picked up Forge's gun and shot Hercules saying, I never liked him anyway. He then bows down before the Hulk saying, here you are, sir, handing him the gun. With Hercules defeated once and for all, now wielding Forge's gun, which is strong enough to kill beings like the Hulk and Hercules, the Hulk screams, anybody else have anything they want to add? Yeah, 
didn't think so. He then yells, Jones, you're next, as he thinks Jones sent a cord to kill him with his gun in the first place. But when Hulk arrives at Rick Jones' hideout, he sees that Rick has already packed up everything and left. But as the Hulk looks around, Rick Jones turns on a monitor and webcam he left there to talk to the Hulk, saying, hey Bruce, how's it hanging? Got Forge's gun, huh? Hulk says, afraid to face me, Jones? He answers saying, well, duh, you've got heavy armament and you're nuts. Any sane person would be afraid to face you. Jones goes on to tell him that he thinks he's crazy and that he's turned into the abusive SOB who destroyed his son and turned him into the shell of a man he became, AKA Bruce Banner became his father, Brian Banner. At this point, Hulk says, shut up. And then Jones just says, goodbye, Bruce, before detonating his old hideout. This causes such a big explosion that it blows a hole in the ground above. And as the Hulk is climbing out, the minister asks, what happened? And he tells him, I had a conversation with an old friend. The minister then says, he tried to destroy you? Hulk answers saying, you'd be amazed how often that occurs. Hulk then asks, is everyone up here okay? And the minister says, shaken up, but otherwise intact. Shall we go to your castle banner or do you prefer Hulk? The Hulk then looks at him and says, actually, I think I've outgrown both names. Call me Maestro, as we see the Hulk sit down on his new throne, becoming the Maestro. Maestro War and Pax is a five issue miniseries that picks up where the previous Maestro series left off. Issue one starts off with some military looking guys facing off against something. We see them radio into their fellow soldiers, but get no response. One of the soldiers then says, why aren't they answering? Another one answers, how the hell do I know? Maybe the equipment is on the fritz. The other soldier replies, it was working fine 10 minutes ago. Maybe they're gone. The superior then tells him, whine once more, Tangretti. I dare you, as he holds a gun to his head. Tangretti tells him, yeah, that's a threat. End me. You'd be doing me a favor. Another soldier then says, hold on, I got something, as he looks through binoculars, saying, he's coming. He's freaking coming. The superior asks, is he with them? The soldier replies, it's an army of his robo dog soldiers, his dogs of war. The superior asks again, is he with them? And before he can get an answer out, Maestro Hulk lands in front of them saying, hi there. Then on the next page, we get a wide shot of the Maestro towering over the soldiers saying, they call themselves the Stalkers. They claim to govern Connecticut, or more accurately, what's left of Connecticut. I sent an emissary to inform them that I was now in charge. They were to submit to my rule. They sent my emissary's head back on a stick. I didn't take well to such a display of disrespect, so I'm making my displeasure known. At which point the soldiers start releasing fire on the maestro, saying, kill him, kill him, as the bullets are just ricocheting off the maestro. He tells them, no, no, no. When you scream like that, you sound hysterical, like you're scared. No one takes it seriously. It doesn't sound threatening enough. You have to give the order simply, quietly, to underscore that your enemy's lives don't matter like this, kill them, as he sticks his dogs of war on them to do just that. The maestro then asks one of his lieutenants, are the children alive? He replies, some died with their parents, some fled before they could be captured. We have a handful left, should we dispose of them? The maestro says, dispose of children? We're not monsters, lieutenant. Take me to them. When he's brought to the children, they ask, did you kill our parents? He tells them they killed themselves by fighting me. But you know what? You don't have to worry about them. You're gonna come with me. You're gonna come with me to a whole new city. We will find people to take care of you and you'll grow up happy. What do you say? One of the kids just spits in the maestro's face saying, you killed our parents. You can go to hell. At which point all the kids start yelling, go to hell. So the maestro walks away telling his lieutenant, do what he wants with them. At which point the dogs of war kill the children. Later back at the maestro's castle, he talks to his right hand man, the minister. He tells the minister that he has to get rid of people who still dream of something else. Because dreams beget disaster. We've seen it indisputably. Human dreams have left humanity in ruins. The minister tells him, we can't stop people from dreaming, Maestro. He replies, I know, but we can control it. Maestro continues to say, I must eliminate the remaining division in humanity. And he's saying this as several women come running to him, throwing themselves on him, saying, Maestro, we've been waiting for you. But he just sends them away, screaming, not now. He then asks the minister, where was I? He tells him, eliminate humanity's division. Hulk replies, thanks. It's obvious humanity can't be left on their own to run things. They need a single overlord to oversee everything. In fact, it requires a political movement. The minister asks, politics? You mean like Republicans, Democrats, that sort of thing? Maestro tells him, no, 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 that's long dead. Now we need a new movement. And I've got the perfect name, post-apocalyptic existence, Pax for short. The minister then says, Pax, the Latin word for peace? Good choice. And that, my friends, is why this miniseries is called Maestro War and Pax, as it's gonna deal with the maestro going to war to set up his new political movement, post-apocalyptic existence. Or as he said, Pax for short, meaning the title is really called Maestro War and Post-Apocalyptic Existence which is pretty cool. Anyway, Maestro goes on to say, we won't have division any longer. All humans will swear fealty to me and to Pax or be disposed of. We don't need divergent opinions. That's what gets people killed. Free will was a nice idea. It was tried and failed. Pax will rule over all. The minister then asks, over what, sir? You've disposed of the stalkers. You rule over dystopia. The wasteland farmers are hardly a force to be reckoned with. They're just trying to survive. What others are there? Maestro says, Washington DC for starters. There's an entire nest of survivors hiding there, and they have years worth of supplies that could be very useful for dystopia. 
Minister asks, so are we gonna conquer them? Maestro then tells him, not at first, we're gonna invite them to join our packs on their own free will. He then sends the minister to extend the invitation to them. But when the minister arrives in Washington DC and tells Machine Man, the people of DC's adjudicator, that he's there to tell them the maestro is gonna rule them all, and that at this very moment, the maestro and his army are approaching the city, and they are prepared to launch a full-blown assault. Unless they turn the entirety of their haven over to him and surrender all their resources, which will be reallocated. The maestro will then introduce himself and the conditions of his new rule, to which you will submit without question or hesitation. Otherwise, I can assure you, there will be no survivors. Machine Man then says, I see. The people ask Machine Man, any thoughts? He says, yes, I recommend Operation Egress. The soldier then says, my thoughts exactly. Okay, everyone, Operation Egress. Move, move, move. And with that, Maestro and his army start their assault through a secret passageway, but they're greeted by the army of DC. They start blasting him with pulse rifles saying, focus on the Maestro, take him. But the Maestro just replies, you gentlemen really don't know how this works, do you? As he thunderclaps them all away, telling his dogs of war and army to sick them. Elsewhere, Delphi of the Pantheon is just chilling in her birthday suit, watching the Maestro, and then goes to warn her fellow Pantheon members. Atalanta then says, are you sure about this, Delphi? She tells her, I couldn't be more positive. He has a beard and less hair and calls himself the maestro, but it's definitely Banner. Right now he's conquering Washington DC. Ulysses and Hector then says, that means we're gonna stop him. The Pantheon has a responsibility to protect the world. But Atalanta tells Ulysses, in case you haven't looked outside lately, that ship has sailed. I'm the leader. I say we take no action. Now, for those of you wondering who the heck the Pantheon is, well, they're basically a team of half gods that the Hulk used to be a part of. And their whole purpose is to protect the world from global threats. So now you know, and knowing is half the battle. Meanwhile, in DC, the Maestro finally confronts Machine Man, which of course leads to a pretty epic fight, one that the Maestro is losing for the first several pages. But ultimately, Maestro was able to land a punch, sending Machine Man flying. He then walks over to Machine Man and puts his foot on his chest, then rips his head off of his body, saying, did you really think you could win? Well, did you? The Machine Man just answers, saying, wasn't trying to win, just delay you. Machine Man then tells him, Project Egress means exit. This was to distract and occupy you so the others could exit. This body is just a duplicate as I fly the survivors to a backup base. You'll never find us. Oh, and I have a final warning. I have a bomb in my chest. It goes off if my body is catastrophically damaged so that no one can make use of it. It will detonate in three, two, one, and then boom, it goes off. But the maestro is still the Hulk, so no matter how big of an explosion it is, of course he's going to survive. And when the debris clears, maestro comes out of the rubble saying, not one word. Then back at the Pantheon's hideout, Paris tells Atalanta that they've been summoning her. She tells him, I didn't feel like being summoned. He's like, no, we need you in the monitor room. We have a visitor. Once in the monitor room, they tell her he's demanding to be let in. She asks, how the hell does he know we, wait, is that? And on the last page, it reveals that it's Dr. Doom saying, Pantheon, bring me in immediately. Dr. Doom is not accustomed to being made to wait as the issue ends. This leads us to issue two, the last issue we'll be covering today. Issue two picks up outside the Pantheon secret base where we see Dr. Doom chilling on top of a mountain. Atalanta tells the rest of the Pantheon, ignore Dr. Doom, he'll go away. But moments later, Dr. Doom comes in teleporting saying, it seems you have trouble following instructions. They start asking, how the heck did you get in here? Is that some sort of transport device? He replies, of sorts. Hector then asks, what do you want, Victor? He tells him, that's Doom to you. Dr. Doom, actually. Hector asks, oh really, do you have a medical degree? A doctorate of some sort? Dr. Doom then just stares at him for a bit before shooting him with an energy blast from his eyes. Atalanta then asks, what do you want, doctor? He replies, some tea, and to chat. So they go to sit down to have some tea and to chat, at which point they ask, how are you not dead? He says, I'm a time traveler, child. I go where and when I wish. My time machine has transported me here. Ulysses then asks, that metal square is a DeLorean? Doom says, no, a time machine, as I said. Apparently, Doom didn't appreciate the Back to the Future reference like the rest of us. Doom then says, I'm aware of the Pantheon's reputation as avowed do-gooders, yet the world fell apart despite your best efforts. I have come to suggest a new target for your undertakings. Atalanta says, the maestro, formerly Dr. Banner, Doom says, oh, so you've heard of him. He continues to say, I have some interest in this time, and he represents a threat to them. I wish his threat to be attended to. The maestro wishes to conquer the world, and I wish to live in it. Atalanta then asks, why does a time traveler want to live in a post-apocalyptic wasteland? Why? Doom tells her, I'm capricious. He continues to say, the bottom line is, I know his mindset. He wants to rule the world. He's gonna find out about me and you, and he's gonna see us as opponents. I suggest we take preemptive steps. At which point Paris says, the maestro may be invincible, but Banner we can handle. If we can restore him to a human form, if we can do that, we can take him down, kill him, or at least put him in prison. Dr. Doom raises his tea saying, I like this plan. 
We just have to determine how. Meanwhile, at Alchemex, the minister tells the maestro that he has visitors with very old names, very odd names, of heroes mostly. They call themselves the Pantheon. Maestro then says, the Pantheon? They're friends. Minister says, you mean like actual friends or are you being sarcastic? Maestro says, yes, actual friends. I do have them, you know. Meanwhile, we're taken to the throne room where Ajax is trying to sit on the maestro's throne. And one of the maestro's lieutenants advises him not to sit on maestro's throne. And as Ajax is fighting with the lieutenant, maestro comes dropping in, making a grand entrance through the skylight. But Ajax thinks he's attacking, so he punches the maestro back and continues to attack him. But ultimately, maestro is like, hey, Ajax, it's me. Bruce Banner, the Hulk. Yeah, I know I look different, but that's because it's been a century. We're friends. I wasn't attacking you, I just dropped through the skylight. I like to make an entrance. With that sorted, the maestro goes to greet the rest of the Pantheon, saying he's happy to see old friends, and that they have to have a feast. During the feast, Atalanta asks Maestro, tell me about Pax. He tells her, post-apocalyptic existence. Pretty straightforward. Everyone does what I tell them to do, and we live in peace. They all say, sounds great, I love it, we're in. But you know not everyone's gonna embrace it, right? He says, really, who? She tells him, have you heard of AIM? He says, heard of them. They're the reason I'm here in the first place. Their leader, Modoc, put me in hypersleep, stashed me in their underground headquarters. But of course, when I want to leave someplace, there's no chance of stopping me, so I left. He then asks, what's your interest with him? Atalanta says, they killed Prometheus. He says, interesting, so you're looking for some payback? She tells the maestro, nobody kills one of us and gets away with it, but we have no idea where their headquarters is. Maestro then tells her, so you've come to the right place. After this, the maestro follows the Pantheon back to their jet so he can lead them to the AIM headquarters, at which point, they'll blow it up. While in the air, the maestro asks, how did Prometheus die anyway? Atalanta tells him, I don't like to talk about it. He just replies, Really, as we see, he's getting suspicious. So he asks Ajax, the not so smart member on the team, how Prometheus died, at which point he tells him the truth, which is he got sick. It was sad. Atalanta then says, no, no, he was killed. Maestro then says, so he wasn't killed? Ajax tells him, no, why? Atalanta then says, Ajax, you're remembering it incorrectly. Prometheus was killed, but it's too late. The maestro grabs Atalanta by the neck saying, somebody tell me what's going on before I break her neck. Ulysses then tells maestro, put her down. And he says, make me. Ulysses replies, I won't have to. You're going to drop her on your own. At which point he does. And then he starts asking, why did my arm stop working? It's getting harder to speak. What's happening? Ulysses then tells him high powered knockout gas. The cabin is filled with it. It could take out a herd of blue whales. It could handle you. We're all wearing nose filters, so we're immune. And with that, the maestro falls. Dr. Doom's hologram then appears saying, it seems my knockout drug did the trick. Hector tells him it did indeed. And Atalanta says, phase one complete. Now on to phase two. With that said, issue three picks up with us seeing that they have taken the knocked out Hulk and put him in some sort of cryostasis chamber where we see Ulysses tell the team, okay, we caught him, now what? Lanza then replies, I was hoping he would revert once he was unconscious. That his Bruce Banner personality would reassert itself. Hector then tells her, yes, well obviously that's not happening, Lanta. Maybe we just keep him like this indefinitely. But Ulysses tells him, you're kidding, right, Hector? He escaped AIM. Do you think he won't escape us? We're sitting on a 20 megaton bomb here. Sooner or later, he's gonna go off. You really wanna be caught in that blast? No? Well, we need a way into his mind. As the maestro, he's invulnerable. But if we turn him back into Banner, we could hurt him. The plan hasn't changed, and there's only one guy who could do it. At which point, Delphi turns around, walking out, saying, I'll talk to him. With Lanta saying, Delphi, he's not gonna want to, and she she interrupts saying, I'll talk to him. We then see Delphi approach Paris who's swimming laps in a pool saying, you knew it would likely come to this. Paris then says, I thought we'd find some other way. I'm not an empath by nature. Delphi then tells him, your powers have grown. You're also a telepath now. He then tells her it's invasive. It makes me uncomfortable. At which point Delphi drops her robe saying, please Paris, while walking into the pool butt naked, grabbing him asking for me, as she proceeds to use some very persuasive methods. Fast forward, we see Delphi's methods worked as Paris is now in the chair with Lanta saying, okay, it's locked in place. Paris then tells her, I hate this. Lana then tells him, yes, you've made that abundantly clear. Meanwhile, Ulysses asks Delphi, how did you talk him into it? She says, I have my ways, Ulysses. He responds, uh-huh. She then says, look, can I help it if men are stupid and easy to control? Ulysses then says, excuse me? She tells him, you heard me. He then says, I hate you. She looks at him and tells him, no, you don't. He looks at her and says, shut up. She then replies, you shut up. To which he finally says, fine. After this funny back and forth, Paris finally enters the maestro's mind saying, Dr. Banner, can you hear me? Dr. Banner. Maestro responds, no, do not call me Dr. Banner. Maestro then fully wakes up saying, where am I? Wait, I know this place. This is the Pantheon's old headquarters, the Mount, but it was destroyed. Paris then answers saying, nice to know you remembered it, Dr. Banner. Maestro then says, I told you, I don't go by that name anymore. Paris then tells him, it doesn't matter what you go by. 
it's who you are. Follow me, Maestro then asks, this isn't happening. This is some sort of dreamscape, isn't it? You're trying to trick me. It's not gonna work. Paris asks, are you coming? Maestro says, it's not gonna work. Paris asks again, are you coming? And the Maestro finally says, fine. We see Paris takes him to one of the Pantheon's monitors where he shows the Maestro video footage from him as a kid watching his dad kill his mom. Needless to say, this pisses the Maestro off, ultimately leading to him screaming saying, I said, shut it off, while smashing the monitor. Maestro then gets in Paris's face and says, do you think this is some kind of game? Do you? Paris answers, I'm trying to to explain to you the steps we took. But Maestro just grabs Paris by the neck saying, I don't care about your steps or your explanations. Meanwhile, outside of this illusion or dreamscape, we see Lanta saying, something's going wrong. He's losing control. Cut the feed. Paris is losing control. The Pantheon tries to, but they say they can't access the connection. He's locked in. At which point it's too late as the Maestro snaps Paris's neck in the dream, which also kills him in reality. Lanta then screams, no, Banner is awake as Maestro takes off the telepathic link and smashes through his cryo chamber saying, I I told you the name is Maestro. At this point, Ulysses comes jumping in with his plasma shield and sword saying, Lanta, run, I've got this, as he proceeds to chop off one of the Maestro's hands. Ulysses then goes to chop off the Maestro's head, but Maestro is able to move out of the way and grab Hector, so Ulysses chops his head off instead. With Ulysses now in shock that he just decapitated his friend, the Maestro smacks Ulysses back and then grabs his right hand to reattach it to his body with his healing factor. At this point, the Maestro's rampage continues as he takes Ulysses' sword and stabs it through his back. Needless to say, Atlanta doesn't like this, so she takes her plasma bow and starts firing it at the maestro, saying, you monster, just freaking die. As the maestro is about to attack her, Ajax comes in defending her, knocking the maestro back. But the maestro just gets back up, saying, you were the one I always felt the sorriest for, Ajax, because you were too stupid to know any better. As he picks Ajax up and throws him at Atlanta, using him to smash her between himself and the wall, which causes Ajax to start crying uncontrollably. At this point, we see Bruce's mom walk out, saying, oh my god, Bruce, is that you? My god, what have they they done to you. Delphi in the background says, he did it to himself, Rebecca. Your little boy didn't turn out so well. Maestro then walks up to his mom saying, this can't be. You're, you're dead. Dad killed you. How? His mom then says, what are you? You're not my Bruce. You're not my boy. At which point the Maestro starts turning back into Banner saying, no mom, it's me. See, it's me. It's Bruce. His mom then lifts up a gun and shoots him several times in the chest and the head. Then on the next page, we see the Pantheon and Paris say, I'll be damned. It worked. He bought the whole thing. Lanta then says, indeed he did. He thought he broke out of your mind control and fell for the rest. Ulysses then goes over to check Banner's pulse just to make sure he's dead before saying, okay, we killed him. Now what? Lana just responds, now we make it permanent. Talk about an awesome fake out. I gotta admit, when I was reading this for the first time, it totally caught me off guard. I liked that that was a fake out. That kind of happens often in comics, but for whatever reason, I wasn't expecting it this time. Either way, that leads us to issue four, my friends. Issue four picks up with Dr. Doom arriving in Dystopia saying, citizens of Dystopia, your lives are about to change forever. Greet your new ruler, Dr. Victor Von Doom. You may approach and pledge your obedience. One of the citizen asks, pledge what? Dr. Doom says, obedience. The man says, obedience? Is that a word? Dr. Doom tells him, yes, it means. But the man and the people say, yeah, no one cares as they all walk away from him. With Doom left to say to himself, Perhaps I should kill several of them to garner their attention. No, too predictable, it's a new century, and I should try things differently. On the next page, we see Doom make his way to the Maestro's castle, knocking on the door and telling the minister, I am Dr. Doom, your new ruler. But the minister says, I'm sorry, we already have a ruler. Doom tells him, you did. Step aside, please. Once inside, the minister says, I warn you, our ruler, the Maestro, won't take well to this intercession. Doom says, I don't care what he'll take to. He's irrelevant, you see. The minister then says, he's gonna be back before long. And Doom just says, I doubt that. The Pantheon has captured him. The minister then says, no, they haven't. Doom just looks at him and says, you'll find matters will go far more efficiently if you stop disagreeing with everything I say. The minister then tells Doom they've captured him, but they won't hold him. They can't. Doom finally says, maybe you're right. We'll have to see. Then on the next page, we see Banner's body with some sort of liquid being poured on him as a voice says, this is a bad idea. Another voice responds, yes, Ulysses. We know you think this is a bad idea. The first nine times you said that, it didn't sink in, but now we're finally getting it. Ulysses responds saying, make all the jokes you want to, Lana, but when he breaks free and kills you, I doubt you'll be joking. On the next page, we find out that the Pantheon is encasing Banner's body in a metal called Duranium. It's the toughest metal they currently have, but we see Ulysses disagree with Atlanta saying that she should cut him into pieces and separate his head and legs from his body. Lanta says, that won't help. Ulysses replies, how would that not help? He's a human now. We could cut his body apart. Hell, we could run him through a wood chipper. She tells him he got shot in the head and heart, and that didn't kill him. His regeneration capabilities are unknown, meaning if we cut him into a half dozen pieces, we might wind up with a half a dozen hulks to deal with. Ulysses says, that wouldn't happen. Lanta then looks at him saying, care to bet your life on it? Because I don't. Now, as we just learned, even after being shot in the head, Banner is still alive. And since he's still alive, we're taken inside of his consciousness where we see him talking to his old friend, 
Doc Samson. Samson says they're encasing you in duranium. They figured that they could smother you. And when it hardens, it'll encase you. Banner asks, can I stop them? Samson says, maybe. Question is, do you want to? How much do you really want to live, Bruce? At this point, the Hulk or Maestro aspect of Bruce's personality comes in saying, have I taught you anything? You're better than Samson here, better than your parents, better than anyone who ever tried to help you. All they did was weaken you. As you grab Samson by the face saying, shut up. This is who you listen to, Banner? In case you haven't noticed, the Pantheon is trying to end you. Samson doesn't care. Your dad and mom don't care, but I care. When are you gonna realize who your friends are, Bruce? As he snaps Samson's neck. Then in reality, we see that Lanta and the rest of the Pantheon are done encasing Bruce. Hector asks, can he breathe? Lantis says, we left an air hole, so he should be okay. Paris then asks, and he can't break out. You're sure? Lantis says, positive. Which is comic book for, he's about to break out. Meanwhile, the maestro tells Banner, they think they have you. Show them. Bruce, show them who's in charge. Show them who's the strongest one there is. And on the next page, we see the maestro break free from the duranium. Shocker. It's at this point the Pantheon start charging to where the Maestro is with Ulysses saying, I told you, I told you, and Lanta saying, oh shut up. Once the Pantheon arrives, the Maestro starts beating the crap out of them for real this time, holding Lanta with one hand and punching Ajax back like a fly. Maestro then says to Ulysses, you want to save her? Fire the missiles at aim. That was the deal. I keep my word, do you? So of course, Ulysses obliges to save Lanta. Maestro then asks Lanta, what's the matter, Atalanta? Are you afraid to die? She says, afraid? I deserve to die. We all do. The world ended and we did nothing to stop it. We should all be dead, Maestro says, your call, as he snaps her in half with one squeeze of his hand, telling Ulysses, I gave her her wish. Ulysses then responds, I knew you would, and I did what I said. I launched one set of missiles at aim. Maestro says, one set? Where did you fire the second set? Ulysses looks at him saying, I'd leave if I were you. We are then taken to the aim underground base where MODOK realizes him and his whole team are about to die. One of the members of AIM asks MODOK, what do we do? He says, we die, but we shall be avenged. Ironic, after all these years, we become the Avengers. Then on the page after this, we see the Pantheon gather around each other while they're holding Lanta's body, preparing to die in each other's arms, with Ulysses saying, it's over, finally, as the missiles finally hit, killing them. Then on the last page of the issue, we see the maestro look on from a mountainside while petting a wolf saying, hey there. And just like that, issue four comes to an end. The Maestro War Impact's finale pits Doctor Doom against the maestro, challenging him for the throne to rule over dystopia. The issue starts off with Maestro narrating, saying, My people, my beloved citizens, how they look up to me. Literally, AIM thought they could keep me locked up indefinitely. The Pantheon thought the same thing. They both learned otherwise. No one could stop me in the post-apocalyptic world in which we exist. I am the ultimate power, as he lands back in his kingdom of dystopia. One of the citizens then looks at Maestro, saying, Oh, you're back. Maestro replies, Of course I'm back. Who said I wouldn't be? And another person points to his castle, saying, Him. On the next page, we see Maestro kick open the doors to his castle, as we see Doctor Doom sitting on his throne saying, well, well, look who finally showed up. Maestro then slowly walks towards Doom and stares him down before they shake hands saying, doctor to each other. Doom then asks, Maestro, hungry? He replies, famished. Revealing they've been working together this whole time. And as they're feasting on food, Dr. Doom says, so my plan worked perfectly? Yes. Maestro answers, they threw in a few wrinkles we weren't expecting. They tried to screw with my mind. Dr. Doom asks, how? Maestro tells him, it doesn't matter. They failed. Doom then asks, and aim? Maestro tells him, blown to hell. Doom then says, so we accomplished all of our goals. Maestro answers, we did indeed. Dr. Doom then holds up his glass for a toast saying, working together, we disposed of the last two organizations that could impede us. And now we can unite and rule the world together. But as Doom drinks, Maestro says, yeah, about that. Doom says, what does that mean? Maestro tells him it means I poisoned your wine. See, I was never really good at the whole working together with others thing. As Doom starts to choke on the wine, feeling the effects of the poison, Maestro continues to say, I'm surprised you fell for that, with you being such a genius and all. I mean, poisoning Hercules was easy. He was strong on the outside, but normal on the inside. But you, I just can't believe you didn't see it coming. At which point Dr. Doom looks up at him saying, I did. And then blasts him with energy sending Maestro flying through the wall and out of his castle. Doom then flies over to Maestro saying, I took an antitoxin before swallowing a single bite. I knew you'd poison something I would eat or drink. You can't dispose of me that easily. Doom then proceeds to electrocute Maestro saying, let us see how the power of a thousand lightning storms fares against you. Maestro answers, it doesn't. Smashing the ground causing Doom to have to hover above it. Doom then tells Maestro, impressive. You're strong. I'll give you that. Strong than when we fought before. But there's more to winning a battle than strength. There's strategy. There's knowing your opponent's weakness, and then there's just a matter of having fun, as he uses his gauntlets again to blast the Hulk away. We then see that the maestro managed to steer his flight to land inside the Alchemax building, which as he says, is exactly where he wants to be. Doom then flies to him saying, well, this is an interesting facility. I can make much use of what's here. Now let's see where he's hiding. Ah, one floor down, excellent. Doom then asks Maestro, did you think you would get away that easily? You're looking up at the new ruler of dystopia banner. Nothing you can do will change that. Maestro then answers, 
Wanna bet? See, you forgot one other aspect of winning a battle, choosing your surroundings. The castle didn't have much that would help me win this bout. Alchemax has proved otherwise. Dr. Doom asks, what's happening? Maestro replies, and the name isn't Banner anymore. It's Maestro. Like the electromagnets? Pretty impressive, huh? As Maestro then uses said electromagnets to rip Doom's armor off of him. Maestro's internal monologue then tells us when he was in his armor, he wouldn't have felt this punch. Pretty sure he's feeling it now. Heard a few bones crack just then. And now I just heard a bunch more. As Doom goes flying through a wall. Maestro then says, you look pretty banged up there, Vic. You know I'm starting to feel pleased that the poison didn't work, this is much more entertaining. But as he looks at Doom without his mask, he says, oh my god, your face, did I do that? But Doom just blasts him away saying, no you idiot, Reed Richards did. I think one of my legs is broken, gotta get out of here, as he grabs his face mask. And as Maestro puts his hand out saying, oh no you don't, Doom teleports away. Maestro then says, some sort of matter transmitter device, how very Star Trek. He had an emergency exit plan just in case. Smart fellow, hopefully he'll be sufficiently smart and stay out of my way. Because if he ever uses his tech again to try something in the future, he's gonna find a very imperfect future. Which of course is referring to the Future Imperfect series where Maestro first appeared. Because remember, this Maestro series and the one before it is a prequel to that series showing us how Maestro became the Maestro in the first place. But before the issue ends, we get a one-page epilogue titled The Remains of the Former Aim Base, where we see a hand burst through the rubble before seen on the final panel, It's Abomination, with a caption saying, The Abomination Returns in Maestro World War M, Issue 1. Which is exactly where World War M begins. Issue 1 opens up with Abomination as a general in Moscow, ordering Bruce Banner to create a bomb for him. Banner refuses, but as Abomination threatens threatens his life, the maestro walks in saying, well, 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 what do we have here? The maestro then makes quick work of Abomination, punching him out the building and causing Abomination to land on a car. Maestro then looks at Abomination from the top of the building while picking up his wife and snapping her neck in front of him. Then to add insult to injury, he throws her body down in front of him. Needless to say, this pisses Abomination off as he holds his wife's lifeless body. At which point, an old Modoc comes floating in, saying the world he's living in isn't real. It's a computer construction, a simulation. The real world has fallen into post-apocalyptic waste and you're being preserved with an aim stronghold. Abomination says, I don't believe you, at which point Modoc proves it, causing Abomination to break free from the old aim base, digging his way up to the surface, as we saw on the very last page of Maestro Warren Pax. Abomination then starts walking through the apocalyptic wasteland that is now Earth, saying to himself, he should have let me die. That damn Modoc should have just let me die in my own oblivion. Abomination eventually makes his way to a harbor where he sits and stares at the water, trying to take in everything that's changed around him. But he sees something in the water coming up to him as he says, what in the hell? Several Atlantean soldiers come out with guns and say, there he is, he will come with us. But of course, the Abomination refuses, and it causes an ensuing battle, with the Abomination eventually throwing a Ferris wheel at them before taking one of their guns and pointing it at their boss. Abomination then asks while pointing the gun at him, who ordered you to do this? A voice answers, I did, but not to capture you. They're supposed to capture the Hulk. You are not the Hulk. I have no idea who you are. This is all a misunderstanding. As we see, it's Namor. Abomination then introduces himself saying, my name is Emil Blonsky, though some call me the Abomination. Namor then says, here, take this pill. It allows you to breathe underwater and come with me. Abomination asks, why should I? Namor replies, are you doing anything else? Elsewhere, we see the maestro returning to his palace in dystopia where the minister asks, can I safely assume that Dr. Doom is disposed of? Maestro replies, he got away. It continues to say he doesn't care as long as he rots in Latveria, staying out of his way. We are then taken to Dr. Doom, who we see is very badly injured with a broken arm and broken legs, being wheelchair bound, having to be pushed around by his assistant, Winston. But hurt or not, this is Dr. Doom, so he's still planning on a way to take down Maestro. He even contacts Rick Jones for help, but sees that Jones is going senile and is gonna be no use to him. We are then brought back to Dystopia, where we see the minister who works for the Maestro is secretly plotting against him with with Namor. We also learn that Namor has made several cities under the sea, and the one he's currently in is specifically called Pacifica, where he's taking Abomination. Namor then takes Abomination along with his wife and son to a room to show them what he's going to use to take down Maestro. He releases a secret weapon on Maestro, which we soon find out is the original Human Torch, the synthetic human, Jim Hammond. The Human Torch then starts blasting Maestro with fire, but when he sees it's not working, he tells Maestro, let's see how you survive the Nova Flame, which he unleashes on Maestro, then leaves back to Pacifica thinking he's killed the Maestro, but he hasn't, as he gets back up saying he's headed to the ocean. Okay then, round two. This brings us to issue two. Issue two opens up in the depths of the Pacific Ocean, where the Human Torch returns to Pacifica, thinking he's defeated Maestro, unaware he's actually following him, leading Maestro to Namor City. When the Human Torch arrives, Namor asks, so, how did it go? He responds, I incinerated whatever remained of Los Angeles and the Maestro. Namor asks, so you're saying the Maestro is dead? Human Torch replies, I'm saying that no one could survive that heat, nothing living. Namor then says, well done, James, it's nice to have him attended to. But as soon as he says 
says that he hears a big boom as Namor's soldiers scream attack. At which point we see it's Maestro saying, by all means, bring it, as he starts smashing his way in. Maestro then says, Namor, are you going to hide behind your guards or do you have the nerve to come out and face me? He replies, I have more than sufficient nerve, even warning Maestro to stand down, which causes Maestro to start laughing. At which point Namor says, stop laughing or I'll unleash my guard upon you. Maestro says, you mean the guards I just got all across the street? Those guards? Namor says, no, not those guards, that guard, my second biggest. Pray you never meet my largest one, as he unleashes a huge sea monster on Maestro. But come on, this is Maestro. It only takes a moment to overpower this massive kaiju sea monster and swing it at Namor. At this point, Namor's son Leonard comes to help, but Namor says, no, stand down, son. Namor's guards start blasting Maestro, but it just makes him more pissed, so he grabs one of the tentacles of the sea monster and swings it at Namor's wife and son, crushing them with a monster. Namor goes over to check on them, but they're dead. It's too late. At this point, Abomination steps up to stop Maestro from killing Namor. This distracts him long enough for Namor to get a sneak attack in with his trident, saying, I'll kill you, you bastard. But unfortunately, him, Abomination, and the Human Torch are teleported to Doctor Doom's castle, where we see Doctor Doom walking with a cane in his armor, saying, help me gain revenge on Maestro. You must. As his legs give out, and he falls to the floor. Human Torch then asks, okay, who the hell is this? As the issue ends, which leads us to issue three. The opening page picks up on the outskirts of a dystopia, with the minister checking out the wastelands in the maestro's absence. He then gets attacked by Janice and Decord. Janice then tells the minister, my grandpa wants to talk to you. They then escort the minister back to Gramps, where the minister says, Ricky Jones, the maestro has spoken of you. He replies, I'll bet. Minister then asks, why are you staring at me? Rick Jones says, Toro, geez, you got old. Can you still flame? Minister Shock says, my God, not for ages now. How did you know? Rick Jones says, Brooklyn accent, pretty distinctive. Decord then asks, who's Toro? John tells her, old sidekick of the original Human Torch. Jones then asks, so why do you work for Maestro? He responds, I don't. I worked for his predecessor. He just took over. I've just been going along with it, hoping that something would come along to destroy him. They then ask, like what? What's his weakness? How do we destroy him? He replies, he doesn't have any that I know of. His strength is limitless, and anywhere that it falls short, he's able to outthink his opponent. Then back in Laveria, we see that Namor has found Dr. Doom's wine cellar and is getting drunk while mourning his wife and son. Meanwhile, the Maestro returns to land saying, I could go after them, but how? I have no idea where Doom is. Fine, wherever they are, let them cower there. If they dare to show up, I will dispose of them, the way I did with Hercules, AIM, and the Pantheon. Back at Doom's castle, we see Abomination has joined Namor in getting drunk, and they bond over both of them being thought of as villains. But from their perspectives, they're not. After drinking so much, Abomination passes out, but is awakened by the Human Torch, who asks, where is Namor? But he tells them, I don't know, he didn't say where he was going. Then on the next page, we see Namor has gone somewhere under sea to summon some sort of sea monster. Elsewhere, Abomination has made his way to Winston, saying, you're Winston, yes? Doom's servant? He replies, that's correct. Can I help you in some way, Mr. Blonde? Abomination replies, absolutely. And we see the way of helping him is teleporting him to Alchemax, where Maestro is. Abomination then punches Maestro, saying, oh good, I didn't have to go looking for you. The two then start fighting, but it's obvious that Maestro is stronger, and Abomination is no match for him. Maestro says, I'm going to kill you, but Abomination never fights back, with Maestro eventually saying, why don't you fight back? Abomination replies, what's the point? Our whole world is dead. What's there worth fighting for? Maestro just stares at him before the ground starts shaking. Maestro then looks up, saying, holy crap. As we see, it's Namor saying, Maestro, Maestro, you destroyed what I loved. Now I will return the favor. Imperious Rex, which is a battle cry Namor uses while on top of a giant kaiju sea monster, whale thing. And this brings us Issue 4. Issue 4 starts off with Namor using his giant kaiju to wreck shop on Maestro, but as he's doing so, the spirit and voices of Namor's son and wife appear with his son saying, you're doing wonderfully, father. Look at them fleeing from you. His wife says, what did I ever do in life to make you think I would enjoy seeing such destruction? Those people running, screaming, they have loved ones, as you did, wives, husbands, children. Do they not deserve to go home to them? Saying, my love, think of what you are doing. And this now, before it's at which point her son pushes her off the kaiju with the monster crushing her. Namor says, good move, son. We didn't need her. Meanwhile, Maestro looks up at the monster saying, that thing's gotta be 300 feet tall. I've never fought anything that huge before. Well, the bigger they are, the harder they fall as he leaps toward the beast, but it just backhands him, sending him flying into a castle. With the minister approaching Maestro saying, how is the fight going? Maestro responds, all according to plan, minister. In Laveria, Winston wakes up Doom and brings them to the monitors to show him what's going on. Doom says, has Namor lost his mind? We want to conquer the world. Who's going to rule over 
over it if we destroy everybody. Quickly, bring me the transmat beam. Doom then finds out that Winston teleported Abomination to Dystopia and asks, why did you do that? He replies, you asked me to. You told me to accommodate the guests whenever possible. Doom then just stares at him. At this point, the human torch arrives and sees shoes on the ground with a bone sticking out saying, was that Winston? He says, was, yes, not so much now. Doom then says to the human torch, come with me to the transmat room to repair it. Meanwhile, back in Dystopia, Abomination saves a mom and her son from getting crushed by the monster holding his foot up in the air telling them to run. They then thank Abomination, but he says, don't thank me, just get out of here before, and before he could finish his sentence, a massive sign falls on them, crushing them. This pisses off Abomination, so he starts charging the monster. Meanwhile, Maestro is back trying to defeat Namor and this beast. Maestro eventually uses a spear to stab the beast in the eye, causing it to freak out and knock Namor off. And as Abomination is about to tackle him, he is transported back to Doctor Doom's castle as Doom and Torch clearly fix the transmat. Doom tries to electrocute him, but he responds, electricity? Truly? Can you think to jolt someone who can absorb the blast of a thousand electric eels? He says idiot while throwing them to the floor. Then back in Dystopia, we see the injured Kaiju retreat back into the water after just losing an eye. We also see that Abomination tries to drown himself, but Maestro saves him. While the two sit on the shore, the Maestro says, Namor did a lot of damage, killed a lot of people. He should be made to pay for that. Doom 2, do you want to do something useful? Find a way for me to get vengeance. Abomination says, you mean like produce a common device that I could use to transport myself back to Laveria and let you hitch a ride? As he shows Maestro, just that. With Maestro getting up saying, then let's get started. And with that, the issue comes to a close, so let's see how the story wraps up with issue five. Issue five starts off with Abomination trying to teleport him and Maestro back to Latveria. Only problem is Winston is dead, but Namor picks up the device with Winston's incinerated foot, and with some plotting between Namor, Doom, and Human Torch, they eventually teleport them back to Latveria. But they're teleported into a cell. Then Doom via a monitor says, by all means, attempt to break out. But both of the bars and floors are made of adamantium, a metal that defies even your strength. Maestro asks, so you're just gonna leave us here forever? Doom responds, oh no, nothing so mundane. No, I'm going to gas you to death. I know you could hold your breath for quite long, but not I surmise forever. This has been a stimulating engagement, Dr. Banner, but I'm afraid it's now ended. Farewell. Namor then tells Doom, I dislike this. Poisoning an enemy from a safe distance, it seems cowardly. Doom responds, but efficient. We win. And winning is all that matters. Meanwhile, back in the cell, Maestro realizes if he turns back into Banner, he'll be puny enough to slip through the bars and escape, which is exactly what he does. Once outside the cell, he returns back to Maestro form with Jim watching saying, damnation. Maestro then says, he said the floor was adamantium. Fine, but it's gotta be bolted to the floor of the room and that isn't adamantium. With both Maestro and Abomination free, they start running through the castle and their plan is to have Abomination hack Doom's computers. But Namor comes crashing through the ceiling saying, found you. Maestro then starts attacking Namor to let Abomination get to the computers. Maestro and Namor then get into an epic battle, trading blows back and forth with Namor saying, it should have been us, Hulk. We should have brought the world to its knees. I teamed with you and I teamed with Doom and you both betrayed me. We could have ruled together, but the Maestro ultimately knocks him out, defeating him. At this point, Dr. Doom comes crashing in in what I could only assume is his Maestro Buster armor, shooting an energy cannon at Maestro, knocking him on his butt. And Doom would have likely defeated Maestro if it wasn't for Abomination having hacked Doom's computers, teleporting Maestro back to Dystopia and taking over the Human Torch, forcing him to go supernova, allowing him to blow up and kill Doom, Namor, Human Torch, and even himself. Doom even says, but you'll die too. Abomination responds, life is overrated. Nadia, I'm coming baby, as he blows them all up. Then on the very last page of the issue, we see the maestro back on his throne saying, the people, they rebuild my throne and grovel in front of me. Funny, I was one of the first Avengers, and then I belonged to a group called the Defenders. And I seem to recall Namor and the Human Torch were also part of a group, but in the end, groups aren't necessary. I suppose if you're sufficiently strong enough and ingenious enough, you don't need anybody. Not when you're the maestro. And with that, the story ends leading us straight into the original Hulk future and perfect story that spawned all of this. But there you have it guys, Maestro World War M. I absolutely love this series. Like the previous two miniseries in the trilogy, it was a ton of fun. Peter David really hit the target with the overall story arc of Maestro's origin, and we highly recommend you read all three series for yourselves, especially if you're a big Hulk fan. But now it's your turn. Let us know what you guys think of this series down in the comments.